Good evening, Bill, and I extend to you all a very warm welcome uh, this evening. Our second presentation in Series 2 of the History and Heritage Group's uh, presentations on the histories of our oldest lodges. And can I just, uh, at this early stage, just remind you, Bill, please remain uh, muted during the course of this evening. We'll let you know later on when perhaps you can uh, unmute, but please remain muted. Uh, I'll, I'll take the opportunity now to offer a, a warm welcome to Brother uh, David Jack, the Master of uh, Village of Glasgow, mm -hmm. uh, St John Number 3 Biz, who is our speaker this evening, and look uh, forward very much to his uh, uh, presentation on the history of Number 3. A launch I'm delighted to say I affiliated to some 10, 12 years ago uh, when I became the uh, deacon for the Incorporation of Masons. So. Uh, David, uh, a warm welcome to you, sir, and we look forward to your presentation shortly. Can I also, at uh, this early stage, offer a very warm welcome to our Grand Master Mason, uh, Brother Ramsey McGee, who has again taken time out of his very, sh very busy schedule uh, to join with us here this evening. We're very grateful for his ongoing support to the History and Heritage Group in general, and in particular to this series of uh, uh, presentations. Thank you, sir. I'd like, uh, if I may, just to introduce the members of the History and Heritage Group who are uh, all with us here this evening. Uh, Brother Tom Jessup, of course, is a past substitute uh, Grand Master. Uh, Brother Charles Winston, who is our Secretary and a past Master of Montefiore, number 753. Alistair Henderson, past Provincial Grand Master of Glasgow. Uh, Dr Douglas Nicol, uh, Provincial Grand Master of uh, Aberdeenshire East and the Property District Ma uh, Grand Master of uh, Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, we also have uh, Gordon Mickey, who may have just had to leave us a, a few minutes ago. He had another engagement this evening, um, but he was with us earlier to help uh, get ourselves organised. Uh, and last but not least, Brother Nicol Scobie, immediate past Provincial Grand Secretary of Stirlingshire. So that's the uh, History and Heritage Group, Brennan. Uh, I'm sure you're by now familiar with uh, all in our group. Uh, well, just again for your information and uh, confirmation, this evening's presentation uh, will be uh, recorded and you will have the opportunity uh, to see it again tomorrow should you wish to do so or pass that message to others who perhaps couldn't join with us here this evening. At the end of uh, uh, the presentation on 3Biz, we will have a Q&A session uh, and I would ask you at this time, uh, Brennan, if you do have any questions, could you put them in the, the chat box and uh, uh, Brother Charles uh, Winston will deal with those at the appropriate stage. I would now like to invite uh, Grand Master Mason, Brother Ramsey McGee, sir, if you'd be good enough now to introduce our uh, speaker this evening, Brother David Jack. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, John, and uh, good evening, everyone. An absolute delight to see you all here. Uh, we've got 64 on tonight, uh, which is excellent. So uh, a very warm welcome from me to each and every one of you. It's a, a real pleasure for me tonight to introduce the speaker, um, a, a former colleague of mine, albeit we were both in separate forces. But David was uh, a detective sergeant and a crime scene manager with Strathclyde Police, a very experienced officer indeed. Masonically, he's equally well experienced. David joined uh, Lodge Nitz Hill number 1478. Uh, as a Lewis way back in 1968 and he's been the master of that lodge on two occasions now. He affiliated to uh, the Lodge of Glasgow St John number no. 3 biz and he's been master there since 2017. Other than the, the lodge uh, business, David has been very uh, active in many other orders in Freemasonry. Uh, and including the, the Glasgow Guild Lodge. So we all look forward tonight to uh, an excellent presentation from somebody with a wealth of experience and knowledge in relation to masonry. So without any further ado, may I extend a very warm welcome to and invite Brother David Jack to now give us his lecture on number three biz. David. 
Thank you again, Marcel Mason, uh, Brother Ramsey McGee, for that uh, very kind introduction uh, to Brother David Jack. Uh, and as you quite rightly say, sir, I'll now invite uh, uh, Brother David, if he would care now, to undertake his presentation on the history of the Lodge of Glasgow, uh, St John number three biz. Uh, Brother David Jack, the floor, sir, is yours to take. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, good evening, brethren. And as Master of the Lodge of Glasgow, St John, it's my privilege this evening to make this presentation on the history of the Lodge. First image, please. The Lodge of Glasgow, St John, in common with the other ancient lodges we have heard from earlier in this series, was an operative lodge of stonemasons. And for reasons not recorded, the lodge did not acknowledge the new body being set up in Edinburgh in 1736, styling itself as the Grand Lodge of Scotland, possibly because it was not concerned with operative masonry, but purely a speculative body of Freemasons. Knowing the West of Scotland, or rather the Glasgow character, I think we can probably guess that some of the comments were made at that time by the Hardy Stone Masons of Glasgow. The history of the three biz before 1600 is largely traditional. Unfortunately, there's little or no recorded evidence in support of these traditions. But oral tradition, as historians now accept, invariably will have some real historical basis. The Lodge tradition is that the Lodge was formed for the purpose of building the Cathedral Church of St. Kentigern or St. Mungo, as he is better known, in Glasgow, about 1130 AD. And that it was involved in the construction, remodeling, and ongoing repairs to the fabric over five centuries. During the Reformation, the Masons Deacon James Robert called together the other crafts and citizens to save the temple, or rather the cathedral, from destruction by the mob. Our Lodge has maintained its strong links with the cathedral and we are honoured to hold our annual divine service within that great temple built by our predecessors, the stonemasons. The second image, please. Well, and this is just a, a general shot of how operative masons were dressed up into and probably just after the First World War. Uh, you'll note the long aprons and some of the working tools. Glasgow, as they say, was a quaint fishing village on the banks of the River Clay, which at that time was shallow uh, and fairly easy to cross. Uphill from Glasgow was an ancient holy place and burial ground called Cathars, which had a freshwater well. We're told about 600 AD, St. Mungo travelled there from Fife to bury a holy man. This fact would seem to indicate that Cathars was already a highly regarded holy site, possibly from pre-Christian times. St. Mungo was taken with the area and established a religious settlement around the burial ground. This community grew over the years thanks to the reputation of St. Mungo as a great holy man and also became a place of study and learning. After his death, the site became a place of pilgrimage. And over the coming centuries, the religious community and surrounding area continued to expand due to the increased importance of the cathedral and its status as a pilgrimage destination. Glasgow also expanded due to the provision of services for the cathedral and pilgrims. Glasgow's growth and wealth was at this time entirely due to the commerce and industry which the cathedral and its ever-expanding community had generated. There was a building boom, 
and the demand for masons and other building craftsmen must have risen dramatically. One of the streets running off the high street directly opposite the cathedral was called Mason Street, and nearby was another street called Weaver Street. This probably indicates that large numbers of craftsmen lived and worked around the cathedral. Next image, please. Further, hence the motto of Glasgow, like Glasgow flourished by the preaching of the work. The first recorded the record of the cathedral was in 1090, when David, the Earl of Cumbria, and the Prince of the British Kingdom of Strathclyde ordered that all the records and holdings of the church be put into a regular state. He was the youngest son of Malcolm Canmore, who had become the King of Scots. The document of this inquiry is known as a noticia and is regarded as the oldest existing authentic Scottish document. In 1097, David became king and he elevated the status of the Glasgow church to a bishopric and authorised the building of a cathedral which was later consecrated by Bishop John in his presence on the 7th of July, 1136. The stone cathedral over the centuries was added to, altered, as were most medieval churches. This, the original cathedral, was actually destroyed by fire about 1181, then rebuilt between 1189 and 92 by Bishop Jocelyn under a charter issued by King William the Lion in 1181. The document authorizes the fraternity appointed to build the cathedral and that they should not be hindered in collecting materials for the building of the cathedral. Unfortunately, it doesn't mention the lodge or the actual masons involved. The cathedral was extended or rather remodeled as a larger building, much as we view it today, and was consecrated by Bishop Jocelyn in July 1196, which took place in the presence of King William the Lion. Could we have image number four, please? This uh, shows you the cathedral in the background with the Bishop Palace and Castle in the front. You can see it's a very extensive uh, community by this time. Image five, please. This is the west front of the cathedral today. Next image, please. This is uh, one of the carvings, just to show you the quality of it. Um, unfortunately, you can't see the Mason's mark. It's, I think it's just out of the picture. Um, but this particular Mason's mark can be seen in two other corbels, which are uh, housed in the under church of the cathedral. It was Bishop Jocelyn who secured for Glasgow the right to hold a twice weekly market and an annual fair during the month of July. This is still held today and is obviously the Glasgow Fair. He also uh, elevated Glasgow's status to a borough of regalty, which was granted by the King. This meant that the borough of Glasgow was under the direct jurisdiction of the bishop and or archbishop. Well, now, if you have visited Roslyn Chapel, you may have been told that the floor plan of the chapel took after that of Glasgow Cathedral, but on a smaller scale. And this does seem to be the case. No doubt the carving uh, known as the head of the slain apprentice mason would have been pointed out to you. Now I could ask you to take a look 
that emits energy from Glasgow Cathedral. Slain head of the mason. It would appear that it was not only the floor plan that was copied from him. I believe this particular boss is in uh, the lower church of the cathedral. Why would their ancient predecessors include such images in the fabric of these great structures? Well, perhaps in a nod and a wink to be initiated for future generations. It is said in one of the essays on the cathedral that the master builder must have been an erudite Freemason, as the floor plan was the same as that of Solomon's temple. And there were many points in the sonic interest to be seen within. It's thought the master mason uh, and architect John Morrow at Melrose Abbey had some hand in the building of Glasgow Cathedral. And it was built under the supervision of the Tyrogentian monks, which King David had brought over from Picardy in France about 1100. This order were known as the Mason monks and highly regarded. They built five abbeys in Scotland alone, including Kilwinning, about 1160. Time does not permit me to go further into this, but there does seem to be a strong link between these Mason monks and the order of Masonry. Could you show the next image, please? Uh, unfortunately, that's the wrong one. Um, I was hoping that there would be an image of uh, Melrose. Uh, on the shield, there's an image of a monk, and on the other side, there's a mason's knell uh, and a rose. When you can, Please visit the cathedral and see what you can find out for yourself. Now, I have to deal with the question of the so-called Malcolm, the third chapter of 1057. The English translation of the document basically purports to grant the Masons of Glasgow the right to form themselves into a corporation for the better government of the craft. And it includes a set of rules and regulations to that effect. It further states that the three incorporated nations of Glasgow shall have a lodge forever in the city of Glasgow. The masons were also to support the upkeep of St. Thomas's altar at the cathedral. It goes on to state that none in my dominion shall erect a lodge without first making application to the St. John's Lodge, Glasgow. When discovered in 1806, the charter was originally regarded as a very rare surviving document. Later, as a poor copy of an original document, and then, believe it or not, even a spurious document, to say that it caused some controversy at the time would be something of an understatement. And needless to say, the experts couldn't agree, but most seemed to incline towards a poor or very poor copy, which had been made within the previous 200 years at best, making its creation about 1650 to 1700. The parchment is apparently all but illegible and this is the main reason they couldn't confirm if the translation was accurate. Although most thought the translation was far too long for the original Latin. Well, I'm afraid this document raises more questions than answers. However, at the court of session in 1883, it was actually held to be a legal document. The document is now in the archives of the Mitchell Library in Glasgow and can be viewed uh, 
by appointment. However, I must add that neither the Lodge or the Incorporation took any official part in the foregoing proceedings. The Incorporation of Nations were under the patronage and authority of the Archbishop of Glasgow, who granted them limit control over the mason work within the borough of Glasgow, as he did with the other crafts. We have to remember that Glasgow was a religious borough, not a secular one, and this continued until the power of the church waned at the Reformation, and the secular power of the Baptist crafts and merchants grew within the city. In 1551, the Masons were granted incorporation status by the city council under a seal of cause. It contains rules and regulations for the Masons' craft. Part of the contract was that they had to provide money and wax for the upkeep of the altar of St. Thomas within the cathedral. Although separated from the Archbishop's rule, the city authorities were still required to maintain the cathedral by the use of some of the revenues from the holdings of the cathedral, which they now had access to under the guidance of the new church hierarchy. The original 1551 document is still in the possession of the incorporation. Unfortunately for us, Again, it doesn't mention the Lord. The incorporation of Masons was a continuation of the Lord, but with far greater powers to regulate the standards of craftsmanship and who could work within the borough and city of Glasgow. It also gave them an active part in the local government of the city, which they had not previously enjoyed under the church. The earliest minute book of the incorporation dates from 1600. The Burgess Rolls of Glasgow list the names of Burgess Masons from 1574, and the same family names can be seen later recorded in the incorporation members list of 1600 onwards. I'll give you a couple of extracts for them. In 1577, a complaint was made to the Town Council by the Deacon and Brethren of the Incorporation against two Masons, desiring them to desist labouring as they were unable to cut the regular ashes. The Council ordained that if they built pure the work higher than one story, it was to be tried and tested by the masters of the craft. What the proviso that if the work was found efficient, they were to be admitted membership of the incorporation. Their, their work must have uh, met with the approval of the masters because we see them both listed as members and the family continued as nations through three or four generations after that. The Shaw Statutes of 1599 state that the Deacon of Kilwarren shall be at the election of the Deacon and Wardens of Ayr, Carrick, Nisdale, Fleisdale, and Glasgow. In December 1600 and December 1601, the elections of the Deacon of Glasgow Nations took place within the High Cup of St. Mungo, Glasgow Cathedral. There is no mention if the warden of Kawanning was present. We can only assume that he was. These elections were held at the cathedral and sometime later within some of the other churches within the city, possibly because the Masons were working on them at that particular time. The earliest minute uh, referring to the Lord is in December 1613 when the warden and brethren of said lodge compared John Stewart, who was the deacon, that he was to enter his apprentice in the lodge. In January 1614, the warden and brethren of said lodge entered the said John Stewart 
of Memphis to conform to the acts and liberties of the Lord. Then in 1622, we hear of one John Ritchie, who was told to stop working as a mason as he was not a member of the incorporation. He claimed he was entered with a lodge in Paisley and had been discharged of his master, meaning he was a free man or free mason. He was later recorded as a free man in the register. The next entry may be of interest to the immediate past provincial Grand Master of Glasgow, Brother James Petty. For on the 29th of December 1602, one Gilbert Petty, being admitted freeman, is restricted from working stone higher than one L or hewing or laying work under penalty of a new upset. That simply means a fine and or restrictions on what he can do. The second St. Clair chapter of 1628 is signed by three Masons representing the Lord of Glasgow, namely John Boyd, referred to as Deacon, and Robert Boyd and Robert Caldwell. Caldwell was Deacon in 1633. They are all recorded in the role of the incorporation prior to 1628. These uh, references are not in any particular order to them, just as I came across them. On the 22nd of February 1751, it was agreed that in order to preserve the operative nature of the Lodge, that all entrant members of the craft shall in all time coming make a working essay. This particular entry comes at the end of a long minute of the incorporation and as the next entry deals with the admission of three members without an essay, we are justified in thinking that the adjourned meeting was a lodge meeting. The entry of 7th of December 1636 gives one of the earliest dates for the word Freemason. Namely, Freemason's sons were to be admitted members of the incorporation on payment of six pounds, 13 shillings and four pence. The term Freemason appears again in the minutes of the 11th of November 1648 and 22nd September 1654. In 1667, we read that all apprentices should meet with the deacon and masters on the first Tuesday of January of each year until they become free men. As the apprentices had no voice in the incorporation, we may be justified in asserting that this was a lodge meeting. Remember the previous entry of 1613, when John Stewart was to enter his apprentice on the first day of January, 1614. Incidentally, brethren, today we hold our lodge meetings on a Tuesday. From the preceding references, I believe that we can take with certainty that a Lodge of Masons was originally formed and based at the building of Glasgow Cathedral and was responsible for its construction, ongoing remodeling and repairs during the medieval period to the time of the Reformation, Reformation and beyond. Can I have the next image please? Lodge of Glasgow, St. John. The Lodge continued as a strictly operative body and confined membership to those who could make an essay, in other words, stonemasons, thereby strictly maintaining the old ways and traditions. In 1729, there was an unsuccessful attempt to introduce non-operatives into the Lodge. 
This led to the formation of the Lord St. Mungo, now number 27. Most of the founder members of this lodge were both members of the Lodge of Glasgow and in cooperation, all operative places. In 1741, the journeyman masons belonging to the incorporation formed a lodge of their own called St. Andrews with a charter from Kilwinning, which they later renounced, and then adopted the title Glasgow Journeyman Operative Lodge. The journeymen seemed to be acting in line with the other journeymen around Scotland in forming their own lodges after numerous disputes with the incorporation over wages and working practices. The Edinburgh journeymen separated in 1718 and Aberdeen in 1769. Then, as the standing of Freemasonry became more favourable, and as the Lord of Glasgow continued to resist attempts to admit non operatives, this led to the establishment of purely speculative lodges, such as St. Mungo in 1729 and Glasgow Cowinning Lodge in 1735, and of course, the Germans. Lodge referred to earlier. The number of speculative lodges in Glasgow gradually increased, and by the start of the 19th century, there were 18 lodges in Glasgow. Now there are 78, making it the largest province in Scotland. Over the years, our lodge has used the following titles. The Lodge of Glasgow, the Glasgow St. John Lodge, the Glasgow Freeman St. John's Lodge, this last one from about 1780 until 1850, when we took our current title, the Lodge of Glasgow St. John. The Lodge Rule Book of 1823 is marked as number three. Unfortunately, books one and two are missing. Some of the titles used by the old lords are interesting. The master was called the Grand Master. I think that's got a nice ring to it. Maybe we should bring that back with them. The IPM is called the Last Master, and the only other office, be office bearers are the Deputy Master the senior and junior wardens, secretary and treasurer, and grand steward assisted by junior stewards. And together with the officer, this person we would now term the Tyler. In 1825, the brethren agreed that the dignity of the Grand Master should be upheld and decided to purchase a canopy for the master's chair. Being an independent and operative lodge, the Lodge of Glasgow maintained the right to carry the working tools and perform the operative part of any foundation ceremony in Glasgow. The earliest record being that of 1626, when the foundation stone of the tool booth was laid. Much later, in 1829, the Town Council made a request on behalf of the Provincial Grand Lodge of Glasgow that 12 members of St John's should attend in the body of the lodge at the laying of the foundation stone uh, at the Hutchison Town Bridge in the same way as they had done at the Foundation Ceremony of London Street. Among some of the Foundation Ceremonies noted are the Glasgow Infirmary, Nelson's Monument at Glasgow Green, the buildings of the Salt Market, the Broomer Law Bridge, 
the new lunatic asylum and the Victoria Bridge, which replaced the old Stockwell Bridge built by King David I. Incidentally, brethren, the builder of the new bridge was at that time the master of our Lord, William Watt, York, and he presented the Lord with a stuffed box made from oak piles of the ancient bridge. And I have the very box with me, brethren. Hope you can see that. And the inscription uh, which says that it was presented by William York and that it was made from the oak piles of the ancient bridge. Rather the crest and the inscription are both gold. And I think it's a very beautiful little memento of the Lord. God the Lord. These foundation ceremonies were great public attractions with thousands of spectators viewing the Masonic parade of Grand Lodge, provincial Grand Lodge, and lodges from near and far, not forgetting the public dignitaries. And all the, these uh, people were accompanied by military bands. And even on some occasions, with an escort of cavalry and infantry. Changed days, brethren. In 1824, of the 114 members of the Corporation of Masons, 96 were members of the Lodge. From that date until 1850, the Incorporation received 122 new members. But only 42 of these also joined the lodge. The lodge maintained the old operative regulations. Whilst the incorporation began admitting those not carrying on the mason craft on payment of an essay fine, it seems that the corporation is copying the old lodges who had previously begun to admit non-operative or accepted members. The Lodge and the Incorporation agreed to separate and a legal document uh, to that effect was drawn up. The Lodge strictly carried on with the old traditions as we read in the Lodge Minutes of 1824 when one James Laurie became deacon of the incorporation. But as he could not make an essay, he was not eligible to join the Lodge or become a Grand Master. In other words, he wasn't an officer of Mason. The Lodge began to meet fewer and fewer times, some years only meeting for the election of office bearers and the festivals of St. John in summer and winter. As a result of this, the membership dwindled to 36 and eventually in 1849, negotiations began in earnest for a cordial union with the Grand Lodge of Scotland, as the Brethren did not wish this ancient lodge simply to wither away and be forgotten. Her application was not rather straightforward, but after many mature discussions and considerations, the Grand Lords granted the Lords a charter with the rule number three is. Under the Grand Lords Charter, the Lords held its first meeting on the 26th of March, 1851, and received seven initiates and five affiliates. Later, it accepted 35 new members, 24 of whom were members of the incorporation. Up to this point, the deacon of the incorporation was also the master of the lodge, but this was phased out after the separation. Since 1850, 
this old alliance, as it's been called, between Lodging and Corporation has only occurred on three occasions. In 1923, 1950, and lately in 2016, when Brother David Bannerman held both offices. In recognition of our shared ancient history, the Deacon of the Incorporation, if he is a Freemason, is invited to become the Deputy Master of the Lodge. The current Deacon of the Incorporation and Deputy Master of the Lodge is Brother John Brown, Past Master of Lodge Abercrombie 531. At the end of the 18th century, the Lodge compared the degrees of Inter Apprentice, Fellow Craft, and Master Mason, the Mark and Chair Master degrees. This fact caused some friction between Provincial Grand Lodge of Glasgow and ourselves in 1857. Provincial Grand Lodge complained to the Grand Lodge of Scotland that three bids were practicing the mark and chair master's degrees, which were not recognized. In defense, the Lord stated that it had always worked the mark degrees and did not consider them as separate degrees, but part of the telegraph and master's degree. After deliberation, Grand Lodge found in our favor. In 1868, the Lodge agreed that there should only be one degree worked at each meeting in order that the members might put home at a reasonable hour. The bylaws of 1874 state that the Lodge should close at 11 o'clock and that no further business be taken after 10 o'clock. The Master's Chain of Office and Pendant were gifted in 1850. Brother, I can show you the original pendant. This was replaced in 1914 by a smaller version of uh, that pendant. The last pendant is used sometimes uh, at installation. During the First World War, uh, many Lodge members served in the armed forces. There were so many members in the E Company of the HLI that it was called E Biz Company or the Masonic Company. After the war, the Lodge commissioned a new altar on which were carved the names of those brethren who had made the supreme sacrifice. The names of the fallen brethren are carved, as I said, around the top of the altar, and the names uh, of those who fell in the Second World War were later added. I think this is a very fitting memorial to the fallen brethren, and particularly as each new member takes an obligation on that altar. Brethren, I'm sure you may have seen something similar before. This is a Masonic passport. And these were issued by not only three biz, but other lodges for the brethren who were going away to uh, partake in the 1914 war. Moving on to 1957, the Lodge celebrated the 900th anniversary of the Malcolm Charter with a service at Glasgow Cathedral, followed by a dinner which was attended by the Deputy Grand Master Mason, the Provincial Grand Master, Lord Provost, and numerous dignitaries. In 1961, as a result of this, a revised history of the Lodge was printed 
And could you now show the images uh, of the glass windows? Well, uh, this is the large window at Glasgow Cathedral, which was uh, gifted to the cathedral shortly after this anniversary, I believe. The next image. And this is a close up of the windows, brother, with the large name uh, and various Masonic emblems. The most prized possession of the lodge is the ancient charter chest. It's a highly carved oak chest containing, or including rather, some of the tools of the craft, cherubim and the inscription, God Save the King and the Mason Craft, 1684. Could we have the next image, please? There we are, Brown. That's the front of the box with the inscription. Next image. That is the top of the box with the carving. Uh, you can see the various working tools of the craft on it. I think the next image might show it a little better. That's the side view with the cherubim. But again, you can see the top. And it's very richly carved, as you can see. Next image. And that is the top of the box again, slightly more clear. Next image. And that's the box opened up. The drawer in the bottom uh, was actually a secret compartment and wasn't discovered until about the 1800s. The chest has been in loan to the Glasgow Museum at Kelvin Grove since 1901 and was later displayed at People's Palace in Glasgow Green. A few years ago, when we inquired as to its whereabouts, the museum seemed to have misplaced it. However, a diligent creator, a curator, eventually traced the chest to the museum storage facility at Kelvin Hall. The Lodge later agreed that we should bring the chest out of storage once a year and place it on display at our installation meeting. And this has happened in the past uh, two years. It was shown with the other um, Masonic artifacts of the Lodge and was of great interest to the brethren at the time. I'll just show you um, two of the Lodge members jewels, which was struck. Um, the large one went out of fashion and the miniature uh, took over brethren. It got much easier to wear. Another item is a Masonic Mall, which is carved from the oak timbers of Glasgow Cathedral uh, from the 12th century. And it was uh, presented to the Lords during the restoration of the cathedral in 1913. Could you show the image of the Borough Hall, please? Brethren, this is the glass window in the east end of the Borough Hall where we now meet. We meet five times a year and it's a very fitting place for any Masonic Lodge. It's the home of Lodge Pollock, Pollock Shields. And on behalf of both Lodges, Three Biz and Pollock, I extend a cordial invitation to you all when and if you can, to pay us a visit. Thank you, Brother. Take down the images. Thank you, David, for that uh, very fine and illuminating uh, uh, presentation on the history of uh, the Lodge of Glasgow St. John, Three Biz, 
And just before I ask um, channels if we would field any any questions that we may have, uh, can, can I just uh, um, suggest something that came to me just a few minutes ago? Um, back in 2007, the city of Glasgow gave the incorporation of Masons a civic reception with reference to their 950th anniversary, recognising the uh, that uh, Malcolm Charter. Now I know that uh, uh, there's no evidence to support uh, three bids being that old, but uh, certainly before 1628 is is the date for for three bids. I just wonder if there's a uh, something that perhaps we could discuss in three bids in terms of over the next few years seeking and planning uh, for a 400th um, civic reception uh, for for three bids. Something just for us to think about in uh, in three bids. Uh, Brother David. Well, it's quite possible that uh, that will happen, but uh, the, think, uh, the thinking is that the Lodge is older than the incorporation. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said earlier, unfortunately there's nothing recorded to substantiate that. There seems to be a reference in 1600 uh, when the rights ask for uh, separation, apparently in their application to the council, they referred to the Lodge of Glasgow. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, I've not been able to get access to this particular document to clarify this one way or the other. Okay. Just something for, for, for the Lodge to consider whether it's viable to, to approach yes, the we shall see. Uh, can I now ask uh, uh, Brother Thomas Winston if, uh, if he has uh, any questions in the, in the chat box or, or, or from anywhere else in the meantime? Um, thank you, Mr Chairman. If we start perhaps with Brother John McInnes, who would like to say something about the age of the Lodge. John, if you're unmuted. Yeah, okay. I'm unmuted. Uh, there was some mention about the, the Malcolm Charter being um, maybe uh, when its first recorded appearance was 1806, and was apparently was found in the in the chart box of the lodge, um, and th th there was some investigation to try to discover um, the the genuineness, as, as David has pointed out. Um, in, in, in fact, in, in 1868, uh, Professor Innes in Edinburgh uh, chaired an investigation. And said that the, this uh, charter, be it a copy or not, was not a charter as such, but um, merely a, a document uh, which was no more than 200 years old. So, from that point of view, um, one one could argue that the the, the lodge um, would only be say 1668 or something like that. Um, but the interesting thing, I, I think that uh, David did mention that I, I think it's worth stressing is that um, the incorporation of Masons with whom, as David has said, we had a great um, connection. Um, the, the oldest minute book of the incorporation is from 1600 to 1681 and the first reference to the Lodge of Glasgow uh, is in September um, 1620. So even if one forgets the dubiety of the Malcolm Charter, um, certainly the incorporation of Masons of Glasgow refer to the Lodge of Glasgow um, uh, and talks, uh, well, in fact, on, on September the 22nd, in fact, in 1620. So my point is that although one may argue about the antiquity of the lodge or the the date of, of the um, how old the lodge is it is certainly true that uh, we in the lodge which is my mother lodge um, can go back definitely to we are recorded as having something in 1620 so i, I just wanted to add that i mean i know david mentioned this but i, I just wanted to uh, reinforce that Thank you for listening to it all. Yeah. Can I just ask, 
that date again, September, what date in September was it? September the 22nd. All right, thank you. 1620. And, and the chap leading was uh, Professor Cosmo Innes, uh, who, who was the chap leading the investigation, which shot down the uh, Malcolm Charter as a fake. Well, not a fake, but it, it wasn't a charter. It was a, a document. As thank you. Charles. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, whilst I'm waiting for some questions in the waiting room, I wonder if I could ask, you, you mentioned that uh, in 1636, was a, a, one of the first mentions of the word Freemason. And uh, my understanding at that time was that the word Freemason was spelt with a hyphen between free and Mason. Do you happen to know how that was spelt? Uh, in the, the record, it seems to be one word, Freemason. And that is quite unusual because at that time, most of the spellings were, were hyphenated. Yes. Um, other uh, books you see it as two words, um, but they also use the term free man, and it uh, is recorded as one word as well, whereas in other places, free man is recorded, you know, with a hyphen between free and man. It might just be an idiosyncrasy of the scribe at the time. Could I also ask you about your coat of arms? You have a, a lamb and an eagle. Have yes, you, that's, that's the emblems for both St. John's. That, that's interesting. I, I didn't know that. So uh, the lamb, was that St. John the Evangelist? Yes. The, the uh, lamb has been taken as a symbol of the church, of course. And the, the eagle was... Uh, the second century. And did the Lodge celebrate, you mentioned both the summer and the winter? Saints yes, Saints. it's recorded that they, they did that and the, the summer uh, eventually it became an outing uh, to various places in Scotland. But it appears they, after the dinner they held a, a short meeting for whatever reason, um, it's not stated. But they certainly celebrated both uh, the winter and summer uh, festive days for St John. That's all the questions I have, Mr Chairman. If anyone has any other questions, we'll, we can open it up. In which case, I'll, I'll hand it back to you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Charles. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Brown. Um, and thank you, in, in particular, uh, Brother David Jack, for answering those uh, one or two questions there. Um, not always easy to answer questions that are off the cuff, but you did very well, so thank you very much for that. Thank you for your presentation, for your answering your questions, and uh, overall, the work that you have uh, undertaken uh, to present uh, the history of the Lodge of Glasgow St. John and the Three Bears. Thank you, sir. Um, brother, brother David, um, I, yes, I wasn't. I was on mute there. I didn't realise I was. Um, when a, the Masons a, from out with Glasgow came to the cathedral seeking work, apart from a, tendering their indentures, their documents, or a, proofs, a, what physical a, a, tests were they given? A, to prove that they were actually capable of working in stone to a high standard. Do you have any records of a, the tests? No, there's nothing recorded as far as I'm aware for Glasgow, but uh, in other um, operative documents or references, uh, they would be shown to the lodge, you know, the actual working lodge, Yes. And given a block of stone mm -hmm. and uh, asked to shape it. Right. Uh -huh. and this was a practical test as to the. Uh, yes, that's what I meant what the pra pra practical tests would be. Yeah. And then they would be accepted. But of course, the big thing is being able to give the Mason word 
Yes, if we were able to do that. Uh, I think there would be near enough home and dry. Yeah, I just wondered what the practical tests, I knew about the Masons uh, word and also uh, their indentures and etc and documents, but uh, I didn't know if there was any practical tests, but thank you, I understand now. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, both Davids. Um, Brown, just before uh, we wrap things up, I wonder if I might just uh, offer the opportunity to Grandmaster Mason, Brother Ramsey McGee, if he would care to, to say a few uh, remarks. Thank you very much, John. David, could I, on behalf of everyone, uh, thank you for a, a, an absolutely fascinating insight into the uh, Lodge St John Three bids tonight. I, I found it absolutely fascinating, and some of your um, your pictorial stuff was, you know, it was worth coming along just to see that uh, it was really first class. So thank you very much. You've obviously put a, a power of work into the, the 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 investigation, for want of a better word. Uh, of the, the, the history, but uh, absolutely first class. So thank you very much indeed uh, for bringing to life tonight the, the history of 3 biz. Thank you. Thank you. Thank well you done, David Jack. Well done. Thank okay. you, David. Well, well our, uh, our next meeting is a week this evening, the 23rd of September. Uh, and on that occasion, Brother Scott, who is with us this evening, uh, a past master of uh, Glasgow Co-owning Lodge Number 4, uh, will present uh, uh, his history of that uh, old lodge, Glasgow Co-owning Number 4. Uh, so we'll look forward to that uh, with great anticipation, Brother David Scott, uh, if you're still with us. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, you will uh, rise to the standards required of such a such a final block. <laughs> it's a high bar, a high bar indeed. We, we look David, forward to, to your presentation John, next week. Sorry. John, just to let David know, I've already got a question for him. Oh, <laughs> after I didn't ask you one. Well, we, we need to come and visit and pay you back for that, David, in due course. No, well, Brother Scott, you're in trouble. The Glasgow Police want to have a word with you and ask you some questions. <laughs> Anyway, next uh, uh, next Wednesday, 23rd of September at 7 o'clock, the history of Glasgow Co-Winning Lodge number four by Past Master Brother David Scott. We look forward to that. Good night, Brennan. And uh, Good night, yeah, David. Now just say thank you to all for your attendance and support this evening. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you all, Brennan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Good night, Good night all. all. Good night. Happy to be here for the first time from Jamaica. Ah, good to Welcome see you, Trevor. Trevor. Good evening, Brother Christian. How are you? Yes, Grandmaster Mason. Good, good to see you, Trevor. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, sir. Good. Very good to see you, too. Yeah, I think it's a bit warmer where you are than where we are. Oh Lord, it, it it's raining, but oh, warm. Well. it's raining. <laughs> Lots of rain. Might be a common denominator then. <laughs> yes. But we Trevor, we say here that today's rain is tomorrow's whiskey. So <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you, brother, and good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank good you. Night. Greetings from Cape good Town. Good night. Good night. Well done again, David. Good night. Thanks, John. Well done, Thanks for again, Charles. Welcome to you. Very good, good presentation. Good, Wonderful good presentation, David. For a lovely uh, uh, educational piece here. Thank you. Uh, Earl Mortensen, Newfoundland, Kilwainy, 1754. Nice to see you. Welcome. Thanks again, Charles, for your assistance. You're welcome, David. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.